Okay, uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to this session. We're going to introduce the panel. Uh, the panel is gonna be talking about creating a society founded on divine principles, which is a topic of this conference. I'm gonna do a very short introduction of each panelist. And uh, you know all of them, so I guess I'm justified just to say a few words about each one. Uh, we have Ms. Erica Toussaint, who I know as an ex-member, previous member of the National Assembly of the United States for 15 years. She currently was just, uh, you were just elected to the Regional Council of Northwestern States. And uh, I happen to love the way she talks and the stories that she tells and just, um, Anyway, I love her very much, and I'm sure you enjoy, will enjoy her talk. Um, then we have Mr. Jamie Heath. Hi. Uh, he is a songwriter, a musician, and producer. And he has uh, co-written and produced many songs, uh, or maybe just, just songs, not many songs, <laughs> for many Grammy Award artists. He also has enjoyed a life of uh, scoring music for TV and film. Uh, and then we have Ms. Layla Miller. Layla, no, I'm sorry, sorry. Yeah, okay, yeah. yeah. Layla Milani, yes, pretty close, right? Uh, Layla is a senior international policy advocate for Futures Without Violence, where she leads their work on global violence prevention with a focus on women and children. Uh, she's a lawyer and human rights advocate with special expertise in women's rights, religious freedom, and conditions in Iran. And of course we have um, Payam, Dr. Payam Akhavan, uh, who is a professor of international law at McGill University, a member of the International Court of Arbitration and former UN prosecutor at The Hague. Uh, he is a founder, he's the founder of the Iran Human Rights Documentation Center. Uh, in October 2017, he delivered the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation's Massey Lectures. Is it called Massey? Massey? Uh, the companion book, uh, a memoir entitled In Search of a Better World, <laughs> A Human Rights Odyssey, became the number one bestseller, nonfiction, in Canada. I thought I should mention that. Uh, each of the panelists... Each of the panelists were given 10 minutes, I guess they were told, right? 10 minutes of talk on the topic. And uh, I would like to ask them to please stick to the timing. And uh, after that, we're going to, to hopefully have uh, questions and answers. So please think about the questions that, that come to your minds. And there is a microphone right in the middle, and you can actually queue up uh, to ask questions. And we'll see how it goes. I would like really to see this as an interactive session, uh, as interactive as we can, obviously. Thank you. So can we start with uh, Erica? Sure. Yes, ladies first. I'm not, can you hear me if I don't pull the mic close? No. No, okay. They did a sound check, but not a distance check. Now I, I think I may have pushed a button. How's this? Yeah? Let's see if we can get it off my papers. Does this work? Okay, now start my time. <laughs> so dear friends, this is a broad question, applying spir spiritual principles to the building of divine civilization. And so I thought I might just spend a few moments talking about the application of principle and then maybe give a few examples. When I was young, it was elusive to me how to even identify what the principles were, what the laws were, what truth was, and then how to tease out the concept of principles and then see their broad application. And uh, thankfully, that has become less of a mystery as I've gotten older and had more experience in studying the writings. So perhaps maybe just a little bit of an exploration of that might be a good way to get us started. Principles are things that you can apply in many different settings. So they are not rules for the road on a particular topic. Uh, so for instance, uh, when, the, uh, when the House of Justice speaks to us about the solution for all the ills of the world, they say that until we have unity, 
we will not be able to solve any of these ills of the world. And of course, that is because Baha'u'llah says that. So then a Baha'i who wants to apply that principle is going to know that no matter how high-minded or desirable it is for us to engage in discourse about specific solutions, I'll just use save the whales, which is all of the things that people want to do, of course, is admirable. But we can't save the whales until we have unity. Because what I do on this shore may not be done on the next shore, and the next shore, and then what I do in the ocean, and then who owns the ocean, and what rules apply to the ocean, and all that kind of stuff can't really be worked out until there's unity. So a Baha'i would know that the solution to solving the whales, the, the issue of save the whales, cannot be really approached until. I like to look at Abdu'l Baha and the way he moved through the world because, you know, in Haifa, he took care of the poor. And Baha'u'llah enjoined all of us to care for the poor. And yet Abdu'l Baha did not tell us to launch campaigns to take care of the poor specifically. Rather, he said, spread the message of Baha'u'llah knowing that until we have unity and the recognition of the oneness of mankind, we are not going to be able to solve the poverty problem. That doesn't mean that he didn't assist those who were nearby with his own means. So for instance, there's a letter from the Universal House of Justice to a national assembly who was questioning them, who was asking for guidance actually for them, from them about what to do about the flow of migrants into Europe. This was a European uh, country. And the House of Justice says, of course, a Baha'i's heart is going to be touched and moved by how distressing the circumstances are that these people um, experience. And yet, in your country, you do not have the resources even to address this issue. You don't have the human beings. We are a small Baha'i community in that country. So of course, if there's an individual who has the means or has a, the organization, we can address that. But we, as a Baha'i community, cannot take on that problem. We have to continue with the community building activities which transform lives, which eventually then create the wave of the ability to be unified to work with consultation which is the foundation really of justice, and eventually we will solve that problem. Because really the wave of migrants, it's, it's a problem at one end as the people come into Europe from those other areas, but its cause is war and bloodshed and strife and disunity in their own homelands and between their own people. So we will always have refugees in waves moving around the country, around the countries until we solve the problem of unity. So Baha'is are keeping their eyes on the prize. The fastest way to solve name your issue is for us to diligently work with no time to lose to bring about unity. So another example, in the, in the National Assembly's letter, the 25th letter, uh, February 25th letter that came out, in, a, in one of the paragraphs there, they talk about addressing things at the basis, at the level of naming the aspirations of people. And it has really helped me. I listened to the Secretary's report at the National Convention last year, where he spoke at length about the interaction between the House of Justice and the members of the National Assembly that they invited to come and consult with them. And one of the things that the House of Justice suggested was that they elevate the discourse to the level of aspirations. And it helped me realize that another principle related to this principle of uh, the oneness of mankind is that there are no bad guys. And once I got that through my head, nobody's the bad guy. Because Baha'u'llah says, when you look into the, man, the face of anyone, you have to see my father's face. Which means the rules are, the principle is, there's no such thing as an enemy. There's no bad guys. And how do we then talk to people who are on the other spectrum of my understanding? If I appeal to their aspirations, we're the same. No matter what side of a political issue someone is on, they want a peaceful environment for their family. They want their children to grow and develop and flourish. 
on both sides of any spectrum, you're going to find those high aspirations. They see themselves as noble. So if we go from that level of principle, of naming the, the common aspirations of all human beings, then we will be able to have discourse with them at any, about anything. And we can appeal to those aspirations rather than engage in some sort of disputation or trying to prove them wrong. Um, in fact, and maybe this is the last one, uh, Abdul Baha is described by Baha'u'llah. When Baha'u'llah describes his method of teaching, Abdul Baha's method of teaching, and for a reference, it's page 27 of Balusi's biography of Abdul Baha. Uh, so on page 27, there's this wonderful translation, and, and uh, Baha'u'llah says about the master that the master listens to all manner of senseless talk hollow and parrot-like though it might be. And then he says, right, agreed. But look at the matter in this way and judge for yourself. So we have this humble posture of learning now that we're trying to learn how to do, and Abdu'l Baha was, of course, the master of it. So when I was in China, I, uh, my daughter was teaching English at a university, and so I was the guest speaker one day in all of her classes. And I would say a few things, and then she wanted it to be conversational, so we opened it up to questions right away. <clears throat> First question in every class, do you believe in God? We don't believe in God. And I'm well trained by Baha'u'llah's description of Abdul Baha's method of teaching, and so I always find the point of agreement. And so I said, I think I don't believe in the same God you don't believe in. And they looked at me, and then I, and then I said, actually, I think the Chinese people understand better my own belief in God than I do. Because you don't have any superstition, superstitious beliefs in God. What you know is that you can't understand it. I can't understand it either, and that's what I believe. So you see, it was so simple when I found that point of agreement. I think that's another principle. We have to find points of agreement and connection and then move the conversation forward. So I'll stop with that. Uh, first of all, I have to acknowledge that I have no business being on this panel. I mean, she introduced, hello, you start with Erica, then you just leave. Then they go on down the line. But that said, I've learned to stay in your own lane, so I'm not going to pretend to be an expert or a scholar at anything. But. Um, I can speak a little bit of some experience, and, um, and I've had a little bit of experience in my own life, but this concept of building a society based on divine principles. You know, I, uh, um, from my life, I've always tried to, um, to adopt that philosophy and put it into practice in my life. Sometimes I've failed. Sometimes I've done better. And the times that I've done better is when I have a better understanding of it. <clears throat> Excuse me. So what I'd like to speak of is, in my own life, I think you know, we can all agree that most societies throughout the world, many of us have traveled different places, are built on some principles of divine pr principles, right? They're, they're, they're not just void of, they don't, they're not left to their own sources. God is infused somewhere. Some of them are doing a bit better than others, but the principles of God are there. Of course, our culture as well. Um, and now we have the principles of Baha'u'llah that we're trying to apply and set out to the world. What I've liked to look at is my whole life, I believed in this, in these principles, and I preach it out loud, and I say it, but then I look at my own particular circle, my own family, <clears throat> my own community, and I wonder how much that reflects what I always say. And it doesn't always do that. And I look at some friends in other communities, and not in a judgmental way, but I wonder how can that look even better. So with the idea of women, so one of the principles of our faith is the elevation of women, the unification of women, right? The equality. And I have a lot of friends who have businesses. How many people in here have businesses? Or, right, or owner, probably many of us. I wonder, when I have a lot of close friends with businesses who champion women, how many women are in leadership roles? How many women do I see speaking rather than the men? And it seems to be more on the side that they can do better, including myself. And I wonder like, okay, so we're Baha'is and we believe in this principle that we know the world cannot transform until we elevate women. Then why is it we preach it, but it's not in practice as much? 
as well, I have other friends who have amazing businesses, who preach and love the idea of equality of all people, races, but they don't have people of color or someone other than what they look like in their companies. I know they believe it in their hearts. We believe it in our hearts. But if we're not practicing it, how can we demonstrate it to the rest of the world? So I think I'm at an age now where I'm changing a little bit, but not like my son who's 15 in the other room. So we need to do it for ourselves, but even more so, these divine principles can transform society with our children, right, and our grandchildren. And so we have to, in our homes, in our own backyards, which is what I love about our, 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 our um, what do we have, our, uh, help me with the, you know, our, our core activities, is that our children, not only for us in our community, but our children really get to like take this and put it into practice. But if they don't see us, if they don't see you, in your leadership roles championing women, women and championing people of color, then they basically also take the ball that we show them. So I've been looking so, so, because in my own life I've been trying to transform it. You know, I've, I've been on both sides where I felt pretty good about my role in society and I've done other things that have kind of destroyed my role in society. Um, and when I am building it, it's when I feel that I'm actually putting into practice these teachings of Baha'u'llah, not just my words. One example, which Erica reminded me of yesterday, was back home, I'm from Los Angeles, which is a world that seems to be not built on divine principles. I'm in the music business, not built on divine principles at all. Um, certainly, I think there's a couple maybe in there hidden, but for the most part, it's not. It's based on all opposite stuff. So we have a group of friends that we started a Ruhi, and we started inviting, very organically, we started inviting people of all different races, different religions, um, different backgrounds, cultures, age groups. Erica was with us all the time. In fact, I think she uh, made sure that we stayed on the straight path. She never said that, but I think she was looking out for us. Um, and we had young ones that were there. And what was interesting, we had elevated discourse, right? wonderful conversations about these principles without judgment, it wasn't a Baha'i uh, talk, so to speak. It was uh, a group of people sharing these principles and our commonality in them. And now, four or five years, six years later, we have friendships and we have built a community that looks, in my estimation, more than any other community I had been a part of. Because all of our principles that we were trying to uh, practice in the real world in our own little community, we were doing it on a daily basis. Now we have these friendships that are deep, that are there for one another. We don't just go to the movies and hang out, we're actually having like discourse about spiritual elevated concepts. When one of us are struggling, we're here. Jessica, some of you saw Jessica who spoke in Divine Teachings, who, was, uh, who is a new Baha'i, um, and she spoke, just declared three months ago. There was like 10 people that flew out specifically just to come here for the day to support her. Um, which was incredible. Of course, they wanted to be with all the Baha'is. They couldn't do that, but they came to support her. She was one that was uh, infused with the spirit of this society that was being built in our own backyard that was based on these divine principles. So, you know, I, I think what I've, I'm learning and what I'm trying to demonstrate to my son, Nak Giovanni, who's in the other room and who's watching so much, and, and I don't want to do him wrong, right? Um, and I carry that sometimes, like am I demonstrating the best I can? I've done a lot of damage in my life as well. How much has he seen of that? Okay, let me just make sure I keep these divine principles always in front of him and let that be the guiding light. But I know that I have to actually put into practice, not just saying it, not just believing it in my heart. How many people of color do I have in my house? How many people of color do I know? How many women am I championing? Um, how often am I being trustworthy? Do people consider me? Last, I'll end with this. My sister, uh, some of you may know or not, but who is, to me, one of um, God's special people. All my sisters are, but there's one. And I'm not kidding, there's four or five times that I have met someone that should know nothing about her, like a bank teller behind a glass. And they'll see me come in with the same last name, and somehow they'll correlate that I'm her brother. And this one particular woman said, oh, you're Naime's brother? Oh, God, what is it about her that's so special? And I'm like, why do you know that? What do you, you only talk bunny with her, checks or something. 
And she says, there is something so special in her eyes and how she looks at me and treats me that special. This has happened several times in my life. I know that she practices these principles and how she deals with people. So I wonder how if we all did that, if we were all like my sister, who I think is one of God's favorites, um, if we all were really like that in practice and not just in theory, how would our society transform? Um, so that's personally what I like to, like to share at the moment. Thank you, guys. Um, thank you so much for both of your perspectives. And I, I love the fact that we're just building on this notion of understanding the divine principles and then what it takes to f for us to implement them. I have a really unique um, job and opportunity and privilege to every single day that I go to work to advocate for one of the divine principles. And that, that is an incredible opportunity. And I have to say, when I heard um, your speech, uh, your talk earlier, I did not know Mona was your inspiration. Well, Mona was my inspiration too, which is why I ended up doing the work I do. And it was her sacrifice. Uh, it was a mix of her sacrifice at such a young, tender age and her devotion to the faith uh, uh, coupled with the, the atrocities um, in Iran and how one group can basically squash the fundamental human rights of another. Those two forces together guided me in the profession I chose. So what do I do every day is I advocate for equality of women and men. And I do it on Capitol Hill. <laughs> I go to members of Congress and their staff, and I go to representatives of our, whatever the administration is and whoever heads the administration to their staff and make the case for implementing programs and appropriating funds to advance the equality of women and men throughout the world. And that is an honor. Um, I, I can't, it's a privilege and honor, and it's very humbling. And in that capacity, I have come to understand and learn a great deal about the principle of equality because of something I want to ask all of us to also do. And that is, one, be humble, uh, but two, really get um, deeper in our understanding of these divine principles and go beyond just reciting one or two principles as if, because I said the Baha'i teachings on equality are, and then a sentence, that we really have a good comprehension of it. I think it's upon us to understand how those principles are being put into place throughout the world, and not just by Baha'is. Friends, we have not cornered the market on these divine principles. There, and as we, we know that when Baha'u'llah's revelation came to humanity, it came to everybody. Some of us have chosen to identify directly, but there are great many of us who are really put into place, putting into place his teachings every day. I see who some of these people are. And some of the stories that I hear from the women across the globe about the fight for equality when I sit there in front of members of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, and I have, through very great privilege, been able to bring Arab women who run NGOs in Arab countries, can you imagine what a hard task that is to fight for equality in, in Arab nations? And then to have the eloquence, the compassion, and yet the confidence to come and sit in front of members of our Senate Foreign Relations Committee, and say to them, you know what? This is a spiritual disease, and it requires spiritual transformation. How can I not learn from them? These are not Baha'is. In this case, there were Muslims. And how can I walk around pretending that just because I am a Baha'i that I hold the answers? Baha'u'llah holds the answers. But I have a limited understanding of what his vision is. But my task is on a daily basis to 
m take every step to understand that. In my workshops earlier, I did talk about equality and understanding what that means. And I want to use that one, um, one item from that principle that is very compelling to me. There's a professor at Texas A&M. Her name is Dr. Valerie Hudson. I think in my humble estimation that she's done the definitive work to prove the statement by Abdu'l-Bahá about the equality and the need for equality and the bird of humanity's flight. How has she done this? And how important it is for us to know of her work and to use, I mean, not use, but invite her work, invite her discourse. And I believe she just did speak at the Baha'i Chair for World Peace, which was phenomenal. What she's done is to make a case on this notion of the, uh, the importance of advancing the equality of women and men because it is pivotal and is the one of the critical pieces of the puzzle missing in achieving world peace. And this is what she says. She says the greatest indicator of where, whether a government will be peaceful is whether the people in that society exercise violence against its women. So she links the security of states, I'm talking about national security, to security of women in the home, and that I'm talking about domestic violence. And this is a work done by the chair of the Bush study at Texas A&M. And how humbling for us to know someone is advancing the work of the Baha'i faith. And so every chance I get, I cite her data. She has researched this 350 variables in 172 countries and makes the point. So when I go to the Department of Defense, I am inevitably quoting Abdu'l-Bahá, right? But sometimes that's just not going to do it, right? So I got to be able to tap into incredible work by incredible people like Dr. Valerie Hudson. Hudson. That takes humility, but it also takes the ability to reach out in our work and make sure we know all the facts on the principles and realize that the, the spiritual teachings of this great manifestation of God has been for all humanity. Some of us have decided to recognize it quicker. Some of us have been able to implement it. Just We're giving all of our extra time to you. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I shouldn't be more than 45 minutes. So, <laughs> well, it's wonderful and humbling to be on this um, wonderful panel. Uh, uh, and thank you for all these thoughtful remarks. I'm the token lawyer on the panel. So I'm going to begin with, uh, I was going to begin with the essence of faith is fewness of words and abundance of deeds, but that doesn't work for a lawyer. So I'm going to start with another quote. Oh, yes. There we go. So, um, so my friend said that he's not an expert. So I'm going to say something only an expert would say. The fire of love burneth to ashes the harvest of reason. Right? So you can see my point. That here I am as an expert, as a law professor, someone worked with the United Nations for so many years. At the end of the day, when I think about building a society founded on divine principles, what I think about is that saying from the seven valleys, the fire of love burneth to ashes the harvest of reason. Why? Because we live in a rationalistic utilitarian culture. Western civilization over the past several centuries has emptied itself of all traces of mysticism and spirituality. We're just at the tail end of a long historical pro uh, process, and I'm not going to give you a lecture here on the Enlightenment and so on and so forth, but Max Weber, who's one of the uh, most prominent philosophers of modernity, defined modernity as disenchantment with a mystical universe. He said the price of progress is intellectualization and rationalization. So we live in a culture which has abandoned religion, and then historically adopted what 
The Guardian refers to as substitute religions, false gods, the ideologies of the modern era that have brought about unprecedented catastrophes. And then since the Second World War, the model that we've put forward of civilization is basically the neoliberal consumer culture, which we have touted as the uh, standard of progress, and which we still do, even though the cracks are beginning to show themselves in very glaring ways. So we are trying to understand spirituality while immersed in this hyper-materialistic culture that celebrates greed, celebrates narcissism, that confuses superficial sentimentality with deep, heartfelt belief. That's why I began with this idea, the fire of love burneth to ashes the harvest of reason. Because the, the faith that we understand is the relationship of the lover and the beloved. It's not a series of slogans, progressive slogans. I'm mean, a human rights activist. We have lots of progressive slogans. And when we talk about equality, when we talk about racism, we're not alone. There are a lot of other people of goodwill that also recognize those injustices, which is wonderful because throughout history, we casually accepted that the powerful can enslave and exterminate the weak. We have now entered an era of history when we find that oppression is unacceptable. We can't take that for granted because throughout much of history, it was casually accepted. But at the same time, we still speak about spirituality in this diluted secular language, which doesn't touch the heart. So we need to understand that spirituality, creating a divine civilization, requires this incredible depth, this feeling of love, not superficial sentimentality, but selflessness, sacrifice, whither can a lover go but to the land of the beloved. In that situation, we simply serve because we cannot imagine any other identity for ourselves. And we don't need to worry about finding our path. Our path will find us when we open our heart. So that dynamic, which is totally alien to my profession, <laughs> getting back to what my dear friend said about being an expert, we're all experts and none of us are experts. We're all struggling in the darkness, trying to find our way. But until our heart is touched, until we develop feeling of overwhelming, fiery love with our creator, we're lost. We're not going to get anywhere. At best, we're going to be progressive, part of a progressive social movement. And we're much more than that. We are much, much more than a progressive social movement. So all this to say that we have uh, this incredible burden of living on a daily basis in this society which bombards us with materialism, which tells us that success means dressing in this way and looking this way and all of the perfunctory ideas we have about status. We need to become so strong that we can rise above that daily process of brainwashing because at every corner that we look, our culture is dragging us down into that abyss of what good, the Guardian called cancerous materialism. It's eating away at our soul. And once we find our soul in the midst of this morass, once we individually and as a community begin to speak not just in terms of principles and concepts and ideas, but about spiritual realities which become part of our very being. When we understand that learning isn't about abstractions, ideas out there, you know, world peace, progress, spiritual spirituality isn't some big idea in the sky. Its seat is within our heart, it's within our soul. So we need to completely reevaluate our language, our discourse, our ways of relating to each other, our ways of understanding how it is that our approach towards gender discrimination, racism, poverty, and all of these ills differs from that of the social activists, because there are many social activists out there, far better than you and I. 
So it's a real challenge. It's a real, real challenge. We need to take it very, very seriously. And it requires the humility that my colleagues spoke about, the humility which requires for us to realize that just as we spend years and years going and perfecting our trades and professions and pursuing a college degree or whatever it may be, we need to spend years and years nourishing and developing our soul. We don't take our spirituality that seriously, do we? Well, our spirituality requires as much discipline and effort, if not much more, than all the other things that we learn in society so that we uh, make a livelihood and we gain social status and all of those things. How many of us have discovered the art of silent contemplation, of prolonged meditation every day in the midst of the thousand emails and distractions and other things that keep us from our spiritual core? How many of us have experienced giving to others with our own hands, being a defender and upholder of the victim of oppression, being a balm, soothing balm to, those, to the wounds of those that suffer. These are the words that Abdul Baha uses to describe what we should aspire towards. And how many of us are willing to accept that becoming that person is painful? There's no easy, effortless way of transforming ourselves, which is the beginning of the social transformation that we all want. It is always going to be painful. It will always involve sacrifice. It will always giving up a life of ease and comfort. There is no other way. The steed of the valley of love is pain. Bahá'u'lláh means it. <laughs> when he says it, he means it. So I'm going to stop by simply saying that I made it, uh, maybe uh, I deliberately wanted to speak in this way as someone who is the expert, because I've realized that the experts are not going to save the world. It's great to have expertise. We need specialized areas of knowledge. But until you have that fire of love, even in the human rights world that I work in, you're going to have this self-contained human rights industry where people are chasing their careers and their own agendas until you have that heartfelt compassion, that burning desire to serve humankind. You have nothing. You could have a lot of fancy concepts and sexy slogans, but you're never going to touch the hearts and bring about that profound transformation. So in a sense, the divine civilization that we are seeking is right here in this room, right here in our own midst. It's a reflection of the choices that we make, uh, our daily choices, our daily conversations. So we need to understand that what we do on a daily basis is potentially revolutionary and subversive in the best sense of the word. And we need to take much more seriously the choices that we make and the lives that we live. I'm going to stop. You did not. You did not talk as a lawyer. I'm sorry. You know, I mean, right? But I'm still. I'm still billing you by the hour. So. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Are there any comments or questions that the audience would like to? Yes. <clears throat> would you like to? Uh, can you please uh, go over there? There. There is a uh, microphone. Yes. Yeah, so everybody can hear you, or you can say it here, and I can shout it out. And please tell us uh, if you want a specific member of the panel to respond to your question or comment. Uh, I see only one. I believe in unity. So my question is addressed <laughs> to all of you. So there, there are two concepts we come across uh, so from the writings of the I don't think it's <laughs> Can okay, someone now? help the gentleman? There. Closer, closer, closer. OK, we come across Good. two concepts when we study the literature of the faith. One is the age of maturity of man. Mm -hmm. The other one, the maturity of institution. For example, the spiritual assemblies, their maturity coincides with the 
coming of world peace. And maturity of man, which Dr. Rachavan discussed, which I understand now, is when the component of love is adequately developed to match the intellect. And then we see from the writings of Baha'u'llah that there are some signs for the maturity of man and maturity of human society. Can you explain to me how far are we from <laughs> those points <laughs> and what are those signs? Yes. Wow. You know, I, I, I think all we can do is look at where we are now and not try to, um, personally, I, I can't explain to you where we are in relation to all those things because it's a moving target. I would say that you could look at where we've come from and maybe get a sense of where we're going. Um, since the time of the passing, when Abdu'l Baha passed, the very beginnings of those local spiritual assemblies that you're talking about were just beginning to show like a glimmer, like the poking up of a sprout of a, of a seed. During the time of the guardian, for the first 20 years of his guardianship, he nurtured local spiritual assemblies and actually was very hard on the Baha'i community. Uh, my grandmother was alive at that time, and she said to me that here in the West, in the U.S., there were two kinds of Baha'is. There were the spiritual Baha'is. These were also called the Abdul Baha Baha'is. These were the Baha'is who had met Abdul Baha, had gone and visited him in the Holy Land, and they did not think that Baha'i administration was spiritual. And especially as being practiced by brand new local spiritual assemblies who brought all of the administrivia right into their functioning along with Robert's Rules of Order. Uh, and so their faltering steps over the next half a century um, were, were just the beginning of the signs of the maturity of the institutions because we had to bring them into being first. And the Guardian has noted um, to a number of pilgrims that he spent 20 years building that Baha'i administration because the faith couldn't grow until we had a systematic administration, administrative structure in place. And some Baha'is just, you know, they said, this isn't the Baha'i faith I grew up in. And so they left. Then he was ready to launch the World Crusade. And as the World Crusade was launched, one of the goals was to establish these same Baha'i administrative institutions everywhere on the planet, thinly spread all over the planet, still almost invisible to the world. But we did it. And by the end of the 10-year crusade, we had local spiritual assemblies or national spiritual assemblies all over the planet. And virtually every kind of people had been brought the gift of the faith. Then the Universal House of Justice was elected and they began to strengthen the maturing institutions and strengthen the growing maturing Baha'i community to learn how to both expand and consolidate at the same time. And I was alive during all that time of huge expansion and us scratching our heads trying, how on earth do we consolidate? And how do we keep involving out pe people who are not Baha'is when we barely understand being Baha'is ourselves? And I remember thinking, how on earth are the institutions going to become mature by the turn of the century? Because that's what the Guardian said, by the end of the 20th century. Now I look back at it and I say, I saw the maturing. And, you know, I remember a turning point in the United States, which I think was a turning point for the rest of the world, when the U.S. National Assembly requested to meet the Nas with the House of Justice. All nine members of them went right before the launch of the first of these series of plans that is a 25-year process. And they were worried because they felt like something they were doing was impeding the growth of the community because we had seen this huge growth begin to decline. And the National Assembly was really concerned. Now, I wasn't on the Assembly at that time, but I've heard about it many times from members who were. <clears throat> the Universal House of Justice then wrote a letter in answer to some of their questions. And you've all had a chance to see it. Uh, it was published in 94. The National Assembly, in its wisdom, sent it out 
the day after it came in to everyone. And it is used now by national assemblies all over the world and by local assemblies. And in there, the House of Justice, because the National Assembly had invited it, tweaked the way we did our work. And it's, they're very frank in this letter. They speak about the style and the, the, the manner in which people who serve the National Assembly interact with the friends. They reminded the National Assembly that it needs to be loving and respectful and humble as it even carries out drastic uh, actions. And within that next few years, you saw a complete turnaround. And of course, that communicated itself down to the local spiritual assembly level. So by the turn of the century, we saw not fully matured local spiritual assemblies, but certainly functioning, capable, competent assemblies. And then the House of Justice, right towards the turn of the century, launched us into this next stage of development. And they began to implement a system that was not local spiritual assemblies, because they are there. They're the bedrock of it, but they are not the only thing we need. They introduced to us the training institute. They introduced to us the concept of core activities a few years later. They, institute, they, they introduced us to, to a concept of how to engage with the wider society without necessarily having to convert them to the faith that we actually were bringing this whole process of building rich, vibrant communities to everyone. And we didn't like it in the beginning. Let's just be honest, friends. It was the same thing all over again as when the Shoghi Effendi began to uh, inst implement the, the spiritual assemblies all over the world. And there was resistance. But gradually, gradually, because of the covenant of Baha'u'llah that each one of us has, because of our desire to be obedient to the to the word of God for this age, we somehow got ourselves together and we somehow overcame whatever the issues were we had with each other or with the ideas that didn't resemble the Baha'i community we grew up in. And now here we are uh, almost at the end of that 25 year period with a system in place that is deepening our understanding of a humble posture of learning. It's deepening our understanding of being able to to draw on the knowledge of people who are not Baha'is, who, who embrace what we embrace. And we are learning to have discourse with them now at a high level, and soon we'll be doing it at every level. So the Universe House of Justice has actually brought us to this point, so I can't tell you how we are doing in terms of the kingdom of God on earth, but I think we can trace a lot of progress. And frankly, this isn't the Baha'i community I grew up in. I've been a Baha'i all my life. Thank God. It's the community I'm now in, where really I feel like there's more of a humble posture of learning. I feel a great sense of encouragement from people. I feel like they're no longer uh, so troubled by concepts like false dichotomies. It's got to be this or this. I really feel like we are in a, in a wonderful place in order to launch. And, and so, all I can say is, my goodness, look at the strength we stand on now. And what is it going to look like when what's happening in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, where every cycle, every 90 days, 30,000 new participants join the community building activities. What's it going to look like when it's here in North America? I don't know when that's going to happen, but I feel absolutely confident that it will. And then we will really see what you're talking about. Yes. yes, thank you. Uh, I just wanted to make one comment, if I, if I may. Uh, I want to, uh, when you talk about the maturity of assemblies, uh, I thought um, I need to share something with this Baha'i audience, because from my own experience, uh, even though I'm not a panelist, but I feel I need to talk to you about this. Uh, from my perspective, and I could be wrong, but I saw the maturity of an institution 34 years ago mm -hmm. in Iran. And the reason I'm saying that is that um, we have evidence. Uh, the National Assembly of Iran, the first National Assembly of Iran, during the revolution, when the revolution happened in 1980, uh, 
as you know, they disappeared. Nobody knows what happened to them. At that time, uh, my mother, my dad was in that National Assembly, and then my mother was there meeting with them as one of the auxiliary board members because of the situation. I think your father-in-law was in that assembly. And because of the situation, always the House of Justice had asked uh, that the three of the auxiliary board members would always be present. Actually, two out of three auxiliary board members for Tehran would actually be meeting with the National Assembly of Iran. And the day that they were taken, they were abducted, my mom happened to be not in that assembly, so she was saved. However, after they were taken away, uh, my mom, uh, she wrote a letter to the House of Justice immediately after their abduction. And um, she started the letter, it's like a 17-page letter, and to me, it's a historical letter, and I think that period of time, maybe in the future, the historians would take a look at it and really analyze it. Uh, she wrote about these uh, nine members of the National Assembly to the House of Justice that were gone and two of the auxiliary board members. And she described first each of these members, and she said this is what they were doing before the revolution, and this is the way they were doing after the revolution. Then she described the, the workings of the National Assembly of Iran. She said uh, some of the things that I remember um, is that she said that at the beginning, uh, there was some consultation that took place about the events, the, what, what they needed to consult on. And uh, just like any other uh, administrative body, there were maybe some, some differences of opinions. And then she said after a while, there was absolutely no discussion about any, any different opinions. In fact, she said, when a matter was brought up, it was only with a glance that everybody agreed. Even words were not spoken. And to me, when I read those words that she wrote, um, I just felt that this is probably the maturity, the ultimate maturity that the National Assembly can achieve. And so also the relationship that the National Assembly had with the local assemblies, one of sacrifice and just they wanted to basically offer their lives for each other. So that's the perspective I have and I think so it would, the potential was there and they achieved it and I really think that's the maturity of a National Assembly was achieved at that time. That was about 34, 35 years ago. I just thought I'd just share that with you. Yes, please. Thank you. Thank you, dear panelists, for your wonderful insights into creating a society built on divine principles. I humbly agree with you all. <laughs> that was. Step a little closer. I said I thank you and I humbly agree with your insights. My question and my ask on this is it's probably very obvious to the Baha'is in the room, but perhaps not obvious to those who are not familiar with the Baha'i community. And that is, um, there are fundamentalist movements that are also have as a mandate to build uh, divine society, societies built on divine principles, such as fundamentalist movements that happened out of the war out of Bosnia. I saw a resurgence of a movement in Bosnia, Eastern Europe, in Albania, and they, their take was that if you're going to slaughter us for being Muslims, then we shall be Muslims. And the post-Arab Spring and Iran's influence. So for those who are not maybe familiar with the, the Baha'i community and how at the grassroots we hope to, to create a divine civilization, I'd like to hear some comments on um, the fundamental, fundamentalist movements that are also seeking to build, um, if not through terrorism, at least through some kind of mandate. So. If, do you have any comments on this? I don't want to single out any of the panelists on this point. And how do we address that to, to the world? It's not a competition between the Baha'i faith and these fundamentalist movements. That's my ask. <laughs> when it comes to fundamentalism and terrorism, everyone looks at me on the panel. So <laughs> my area of expertise. Well, um, it's really interesting because 
when I think about the word certitude, certitude is the province of every fundamentalist. It's an uncomfortable thought because it's so central to our idea of spirituality as Baha'i. So what is the difference between the certitude of a fanatic? And I was speaking this morning about my encounter with a teenage suicide bomber last summer in Iraq who as an expression of faith was willing to give up his own life. It's quite remarkable when you think about it. He's dangerous, he's ominous, but he genuinely believes that he should blow himself up to bits as a teenager for his cause. So what is the difference between that and the idea that we have in the Baha'i faith about certitude? Um, so I think that we go back to the question of spiritual depth and violence um, as the, the expression of moral bankruptcy, in effect, that one needs to have recourse to violence when one is not able to bring about um, a movement in society through other means. Um, and I think that getting back to the trajectory of the Western Enlightenment, uh, the kind of materialistic civilization that is now beginning to unravel, there is a tremendous longing for spirituality in our midst. And I think about this great book by Professor Barber at the University of Maryland called Macworld versus Jihad, which is a great title because it juxtaposes the American consumerist sort of cookie cutter idea of society symbolized by the word Macworld and Jihad as a response to the sort of um, uh, uh, homogenization of cultures through the spread of consumerism and the effect which it has in destroying ties of community and breeding uh, selfishness and narcissism and all of that. So there is a tremendous alienation. There is a tremendous appetite in the world to find meaning, to find purpose. And that's why I'm saying that we're grappling in the darkness. We're trying to understand what spirituality is when the two prevalent models are either crass materialism or religious fanaticism. And we're neither here nor there, although in our own community, very often we borrow a bit from the fanatics <laughs> and we start speaking you know, a, a sort of jargon-laden Baha'i talk uh, uh, in a way which I find sometimes totally detached from a, a, a reality, a very kind of bad idea of what it means to belong to a religious community, very uh, insular, uh, dogmatic idea of what it means to be a Baha'i, or we pay lip service to the Baha'i principles while living, in effect, materialistic lives. And that's why, once again, we need to exercise our imagination and realize that we are building something which is unprecedented. We can't look back to the idea of religion as it existed in the past and project it into the future. Um, I also um, wanted to just say that the, I forget, it may be better. So I'm just uh. gonna pass on to the next person. So I wanted to, I'm glad you brought that up um, because I have two points to make on the issue of whether it's fundamentalism or actually extremism. They are a bit different, different as well. But um, and in the work of human trafficking also, I mean, these are all related. There, there are vulnerabilities in our societies. And basically, what those who want to take advantage of the vulnerabilities of individuals do is they ident identify the weaknesses and sell them what the vulnerable feel like will provide a remedy for them, right? Now, sometimes it could be a religion, it could be a teaching, but I think it's really, it's very care important for us to be able to distinguish that. But the more important thing is, as Baha'is, we really do need to, and I emphasize that in every workshop I gave, understand the meaning of the principles we're studying and their implications so that we are effective at talking about what these teachings are and its implication for humanity, as opposed to what an extremist group is gonna sell a young man to, in, to pull him in to its, its fold, 
and in, for instance, the Boko Haram's use of the bride price increasing as a way and addressing that for the young man to pull them into their, into their cause, right? So in this particular case of understanding the principles, we can't just have a superficial understanding. Earlier I gave an example in one of my talks about the importance of, in the principle of equality, educating the girl child. And we quite often use that as a way to explain uh, or demonstrate how important that principle is in the Baha'i faith. That, oh, let me tell you, equality is so important that when we can, we can only afford to educate one child and we have a girl and a boy, we are encouraged and um, asked to educate the girl. If we have a very basic understanding of that, for instance, and the person asks us, well, why is that? And we only reference the very intermediate understanding we have. And it usually is, oh, because the mother is the primary caregiver. Okay, that's, that is true. That is one of the rationales. But we actually need to have a much deeper understanding of that. And since you brought up extremist groups, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to surprise you and say, you know who else uses that? There's another group in the world that uses the education of women that's become part of their manifesto now. And it's because they're the primary caregivers of children. And it's ISIS. So if we have a very limited understanding of this, the divine teachings and the divine principles and can't really extrapolate and explain, um, I completely agree that it is the fire of the heart and it is, it is it will require spiritual transformation. But at the same time, we also have to be equipped with the right information, be able to explain what our teachings really mean and their impact, because that's when there will be a difference drawn between the fundamentalist movements all over to in the advancement of whatever individual cause there is versus a spiritual movement that is designed to benefit all of humanity without a hidden agenda that only serves one group. So we're building an answer here, and I'll make this really quick because I want to hear what you are asking. But we're building an answer here, and I just want to reiterate that we have to be careful about either or either fanaticism or true faith or certitude or whatever. So I, that I've heard woven through these other two comments, but I wanted to kind of highlight it because the moment you have a dichotomy in almost every case, it's false because we're talking about human beings. So I just will reiterate one statement about the way in which Baha'is are going to approach anything. And we can't really, we've heard it said in various ways, we can't go down to that level where there's conflict in order to solve the problem. So here is the House of Justice in uh, 2015 to that same National Assembly in Europe that I mentioned uh, that was struggling with what to do about the influx of migrants into their country. And uh, they say, as the well-wishers of humanity, the friends should respond to such developments with insight, elevated discourse, and confidence. Let them see no one as their enemy. So I, have, I was picturing you meeting that young man and exercising that ability to not see him as the enemy, which I feel quite confident was what your conversation with him was about, not as an enemy. Let no one see, let them see no one as their enemy or wishing them ill, but think of all humankind as their friends, regarding the alien as an intimate the stranger as a companion, staying free of prejudice, drawing no lines. When we do that, I think it resolves some of these questions that seem perplexing because we've bought into the question. That's not the right question, fanaticism or this or that. It's the underlying principles of unity and we can find the aspirations of any of these people at their root has things that we can agree with. The difference between what we're doing and what anybody else is doing is simply that we have Baha'u'llah guiding this vision. We're not saying we're better or worse. What we're saying is 
We have an international community that has a common vision. We want to join with and have others join with us, and we're drawing no lines. Alain Paul, ladies and gentlemen, how are we doing tonight? Great. Okay, some background. Um, I'm a new Baha'i. <laughs> and for those in the room who know me in Scottsdale, I, I, I declared in September, my wife is a Baha'i. We've been married for almost 14 years. So my question to the panel is not more of an answer, but I'm looking for a, a, a question or to plant a seed. I've been an advocate for women's rights for many years. I've been a public speaker for many years. And the statistics that The Guardian say when you've heard domestic violence, 40% of domestic violence happens to men. I am a domestic violence survivor. And this is the first time I addressed a panel here. I do a lot of public speaking in Texas. I know what it feels like. I know what that pain feels like. I know what it feels like to want to protect the person who is abusing you. And I know what it's like to have the system look at you and deny you. Did you know that in the prison systems, the African American male makes up over 4.5%, but the statistics in America are less. Did you know that 80% of those men who convert to a, a religion is Islam? Think about that. 80% will convert to Islam, and they'll never hear about the Baha'i faith. I became a Baha'i because it was dear to me. When my wife was pregnant with our children, she says, a man will never feel what it feels like the joy of a baby growing in you. So she says, you name the children. I was raised by strong women. The male figure in my life was negative, was a negative role model. So I'm like, okay. So my oldest daughter, I named her Analia. My youngest daughter is Tahere. And this is well before I even converted. So my question to the panel is, how can I help? I know what humility feels like. Dr. Brian McCrary, you all know him. I'm speaking in San Antonio, Texas. I'm on the Mayor's Fitness Council. I used to work for Fox NBC TV. I was on the top of my career. I was training NBA players, celebrities. And he said, why are you still in Texas? I'm like, I'm good, I'm good. Part of my speech, if you want to grow, you got to get uncomfortable. It has to make you feel uncomfortable. He asked us again, why are you still in Texas? I said, I'm comfortable. And he said, aha, I got you. I left everything. I looked at my wife's life, my life, and I said, you know what, let's go. So I'm humbly asking the panel, how can I help? I want to help. I know what that pain feels like. I know what that feels like. Women, you are strong. You are valuable. I don't want a weak woman behind me. And I despise men who want a weak woman. Here's my last statement to the panel. I'm the only one in my family who has daughters. Out of all my brothers, they all have boys. My nephew came to live with me. I'm going to leave this. I'm going to plant the seed. He was disturbed. I said, look, look at my brothers and their kids. What do you see? I don't get it. You guys are successful. No, I'm the only one with girls. He says, what does that mean? I said, when I die, my name dies with me. But my lineage will go on. You have a right to make your name synonymous. Do something good with it. So the panel, how can I help? I want to help. What can I do? That's it. Thank you. Um, well, first thing I'm going to say is it seems like you are helping, brother. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you said, I feel like, I mean, just, just speaking real, um, I know you're asking, it's really a rhetorical question, what I hear. I feel like you, you spoke to all of us. I feel like what you're saying is how we can help. 
feel like you spoke about elevating women. I feel you took pride in your daughters. Um, I feel like you're acknowledging that you want to build a society based on principles such as these. And I feel like you just demonstrate to all of us that you're doing it. I say how you can help um, as someone of color, as a black man, um, continue that process with your brothers and sisters in the community. You know, the House of Justice, there was, there was about 20 years ago or so, I went and traveled throughout Africa. The House of Justice had asked people of African descent to go to distant lands where we can be a unique source of encouragement and inspiration to our fellow brothers and sisters, right? Because there's a way that sometimes, the way that you just spoke, your energy, resonates with probably the world, but particularly our group of people. Um, take that, that's how you can help. Our community needs to hear that. All communities need to hear that. So I, I just want to encourage you, brother. I think you're doing it. I hope a lot of people heard you, what you just said, you know? That's what I got for you. Uh, I, I think we're also running out of time, but uh, um, I do want to address something really quickly. Um, so. When we talk about, uh, we talked about these extremists and, and I love that what Erica shared with us. I want to acknowledge something. So over the years, my life, this is not really based on this, but it is kind of. Um, I have felt over the, the last five years or so, I have had a, uh, a hole in my heart for the Persian community and what you must experience. So we have, all over the world right now, um, horrible things happening uh, in the name of God um, for, by different religions, right? There's extremists and we know who they are, but it's happening. And, and, and they have a particular look to them. They come from a particular part of the world. And as a result, so much of Western civilization sees Persians, sees you, and associates you with them, with people of ill will. Um, and as someone that has been associated my life with people of ill will and the challenge that I've experienced, I imagine what pe people who I love so much, Baha'u'llah and Abdul Baha and Shoghi Effendi, the Bab are all Persian, um, my favorite people in the world. And you are Persian, my other favorite people in the world. And, and, um, and I feel for what it must be for you to walk through the world knowing that someone in this part of the world might have a preconceived idea of you or associate you with a group. And I'm sorry for those people. I hate that you have to experience that. But I'm also uh, excited about it because I know as someone who's black, I know the responsibility that lays on my shoulders to demonstrate the qualities of God because of how often people see people that look like me. And because there's so much in the news that demonstrates uh, uh, um, the, the ugly of a particular part of the world and not the beauty, which I get to witness in all of you. There's also a huge responsibility to really take these principles and wear them all over you, to adorn your body with them, to live it so that when people do see you on the streets, what is different about this particular person? I know that's a responsibility I have. As a black man, I know. It should not be because there's others that are doing ill. It should be because that's the responsibility I have towards God. But that, is, that falls on my shoulders. And I know that falls on yours as well. So I encourage us all to know that, that, that we use these principles, of course, for the advancement and transformation of society, but also because we know that so much of the world sees people that look like us as ill-willers, ill-doers, that we have this great opportunity to change their perspective, just the fact that we are Baha'is and we have this guidance. We're not different than them, but we do have the guidance and we wear it all over us because I know that I have a particular friend who now has a Persian friend and it said to me, which in one sense broke my heart, but said, Persians aren't all that bad. And I was like, what? A friend, a musician friend, not an inner circle person, but someone that I work with, I was like, what? What do you mean they're not all that? How would you think that? But his perspective was Persians were bad because the only ones he knows are the ones that he sees on television. But this one person that's not so bad was a Baha'i. 
he knew a Baha'i, and, it, and that little bit of interaction with him gave him a new perspective. So I feel, um, I feel for you, but I'm also excited for you. Um, that's all, I wanted to say that. Do you want to come forward? Thank you. We're five minutes over. Really? Oh, yeah, 445. Okay, the last one, please. Last one? Yeah. Okay. Aloha, my friends. I'm very happy to have the chance to be the last one. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. I'm very pleased to have the chance to speak, even as the last person in this room. I left the room with a very heavy chest. I left the room very unhappy with myself that I left and I didn't say what it was in my heart to say. I know this, um, all these conferences are amazing and they're beautiful and we all get inspired with what we hear. But I had the privilege to attend Dr. Radimi's, uh, one of the scholar, Persian scholars. I'm sure most of you know him or heard of him. I had the privilege to be in one of the meetings that he was in America and uh, letting us ask our questions. We had lots of questions mm -hmm. and everyone had so much in their heart to ask. And all the amazing question about the advancement of uh, uh, society, how the life will go in the year 2000, what would happen when we reach 1992. I witnessed all of that. Yes. And I was hearing today the amazing speeches from this amazing panel about being humble, about try to unify the world. Right. But my question forever been, when we can unify our home? Mm -hmm. By home, you mean? At our house. Our house. Between our family members. Okay. Between our children. Between brothers, sisters, mothers, grandmothers, daughters, in-laws. To love them. To be with them. To okay. show humility towards them. I remember in that uh, event that I was lucky to be there and uh, so many questions was asked from Dr. Radimi and he said I love these questions but I have few questions to ask you yes. whether do you have time to meditate at home thank you are you washing your feet every three days do you say your prayers every morning have you been you. have discussions with your family members yes. Thank this you. was 20 years ago. Yes. And now the cell phone doesn't even allow us to ask our own children any yes. questions. Yes, thank you very Literacy much. Yes. Text. Okay, thank you. Thank so you. if we can unify our family, yes. yes, we can unify the world. Thank you, thank you very much. Yeah. This is my help from the, this panel. You know, I, unfortunately we're out of time, but um, if you were at my talk this morning, I kept waving this book, and you stopped me, many of you in the hall. I think that really the answers to the, all the complexities of that question can be found in this compilation given to us by the Universal House of Justice. So I'm going to hold it up so you can all take your pictures or do whatever it is you want. The answers lie primary, very in succinct ways in the, in the covers of this book. So it's called Family Life. It's a compilation from the Universal House of Justice, and it covers everything, including media and children's involvement with media. It talks about the unity in the home, and it's all about the, the practical application of these principles and how we can bring about the unity of the family, which will bring about the unity of the world. So the short answer is read this. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, thank you.